Alrighty, what I have for you guys today is an awesome treat. My first video on transitive natural theology. If you've seen me or you know me and you have me on social media, I've been talking about this particular system or method of doing natural theology. Shout out to all the philosophers and friends that have helped me kind of perfect and understand this framework. So I'm presenting this to you guys today. Now, I am going to be going a little bit away from this dense and sophisticated and rigorous of a style of video and do some more breakdowns. So really enjoy this one. I really had a fun time filming it. I really had a fun time breaking down exactly what this argument means. You're going to see more of my use of this argument in the future. Let's jump right into it. I'm ultimately going to be using the latest and greatest literature on probabilistic support relations being transitive. So the first question that everyone's going to have, right, is are probabilistic support relations transitive? Well, the question is, it really depends. Now, what do we mean by probabilistic support and what do we mean by transitive? Well, probabilistic support are just relations between propositions that increase the likelihood of another proposition. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit here. And what we mean by transitivity? Well, ultimately, we understand transitivity, at least in the logical sense of implication or entailment, right? We could say that the if A entails B and B can entails C, then A entails C, right? But let, let, let's move forward. So first, we have to understand a probability. The probability of a proposition A given a proposition B is defined as the degree to which B supports A. Nevin Clemenhaga actually has a really, really good paper on this. It's called a degree of support interpretation of epistemic probabilities rather than a degree of belief. So like rational degrees of support. And he talks about this where we have to define these things in terms of their relations. And this interpretation treats probabilities as mind independent relations between propositions that indicate how much one proposition supports another rather than being reflective of an individual's belief or credence. And I'm going to be putting these uh, paper links in the description so you guys can actually get a hold of them yourself. So now what about traditional Bayesianism? Well, we can call the standard Bayesianism or traditional Bayesianism. It treats and conceives of probabilities as degrees of belief or credences, right? So this interpretation holds that of of probabilities reflect the individual subjective level of confidence of a proposition, right? So if you read Savage's work, right, and other contemporary, like Carnip and others, other contemporary uh, probability theorists who have uh, pioneered the field of subjective probability interpretations, there is this idea of sub notions of subjective degrees of belief. And so given the current state of knowledge or evidence, Bayesians argue that these degrees of belief should be coherent, meaning they should conform to the axioms of probability and are often updated through rules like Bayes' theorem when new evidence is obtained. So the idea here is that we model our credences in terms of our subjective degrees of belief, and that our credences should conform or at least, you know, readily conform to some uh, broader stricture that is going to model our evidence. And that's going to, in this case, is going to be Bayes' theorem. And the normative governance is going to be in terms of probability and mathematics. And so following the flow of the presentation here, we really have two pillars, which is how and like, why is probabilistic support not inherently and directly transitive? And, th and that's really the question, right? Which is, well, anybody who's familiar with probability theory and, and logic is going to understand that, well, prob probabilities and probabilistic support relations are themselves not inherently or intrinsically transitive. So what do we mean when we talk about probabilistic support being transitive? And then how's, how's that even going to relate to natural theology? And we're really going to get into that. So probabilistic support concerns relations, right? These are support relations. While degrees of belief concern mental states, they're going to concern belief states, right? Experiences, right? Our thoughts and beliefs, et cetera, and so forth. And so what this is going to look like, right, is if we're going to say the probability of A given B is just the degree to which B supports A, it's very simple. We have proposition B here. We have a support relation arrow. This is to model the relation, and it supports proposition A. And this is the relation arrow here. And this is the support structure. And so ultimately, in probability theory, we would quantify what this is, right? And so somehow this is going to increase the likelihood of this over here, and we're going to quantify that relation. Ultimately, right, it is relations that we use when we talk about support being in transit or something being in transit, right? Remember that implication, the nature of implication and entailment when it comes to, to uh, the more standard un, uh, understanding of transitivity, right? A entails B, B entails C, or A implies B, B implies C, therefore A implies C, right? 
It's just it's through deductive certainty that that works that way. But you don't get that when you get to talk about probabilities. So then if we move on to the subjective probability here, we can conceive of it as this. Thus, a probability of A given B is interpreted as the conditional probability of A given B in terms of an agent's personal subjective belief or confidence level in A assuming B has happened. So let's just say right here that we have an agent P and P believes that A, right? And their particular uh, credence in A is going to concern uh, the belief that B. So if we assume, right, and add on into our system here, into our beliefs, our worldview, B, right? Well, B is going to serve to do something to the arrow here that models our credence. So somehow this is going to raise our credence in A once we are assume that B is true. Right? But it's only going to be in terms of our subjective impression upon what B is actually doing to A. And so if we move up the flow here, then objectivity is conceived in terms of these connectives. Right, This is why probabilistic support rather than subjective degrees of belief. This is why support relations can actually be objective because we're concerning the object, right, the support relations, the support relata, rather than the beliefs themselves right, or just the belief states in and of itself that they are just belief states, then that is ultimately going to be subjective because it's going to correspond to a particular individual's set of belief, individual belief states that are unique to them. And so objectivity is conceived in terms of connectives or the relata and not mere states of belief. States of belief are not what we are apportioning our, uh, we're not apportioning our states of belief to, we are actually apportioning our states of belief to the relata. So moving up the flow, then we have logical relations versus probabilistic relations. And this is where we really get into the heart of the matter. And so ultimately, we have these connectives that you're still going to use in logic, right? These are logical connect lo uh, logical connectives, negation, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, biconditional, right? Not and, and, or if, then, if, and only if, right? And then it is modeled in this way. Now, probabilistic connectives are going to be conceived in a very similar way. When we talk about conditional probability, right, we have this idea of a conditional if and then, P to Q. Well, in this, in this same way over here, the probability of one event A occurring, given that the event B has occurred, is denoted as the probability of, oh, and I got cut off there, right, probability of A given B. And then we have independence, right? So when two events, A and B, are independent, if the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the occurrence of the other, then we denote it as A and or a or b and then when we do the probability times of of a times the probability of b and that's what that's going ultimately going to to be right and then we have correlation the degree by which two events and variables are related and they are correlated knowing the outcome of one gives some information about the outcome of the other so association we could call that and we have support and 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 confirmation right support and confirmation we can conceive of those as being interchangeable you can also say evidence in epistemic context, it describes how one proposition or piece of evidence support or confirms another one, like a hypothesis. So these are ultimately the connectives that we're going to need to use, right? And so in, in at least when it comes to probability, we're going to be using things like conditionals, biconditionals. If we're going to be using conjunctions, we're going to talk about the this conjunction here. And then we're going to be talking, when we talk about disjunctions, right? We're going to be talking about the probability of a proposition P or Q, right? But when you talk about conjunctions, we need to get um, the probabilistic independence understood as how that would be conceived mathematically given to us by the probability axioms. So moving forward, then we have two contentions. Contention one is probabilistic supports relations in, aren't intrinsically transitive. But then contention two is that there are conditions for probabilistic support relations to render them extrinsically transitive. What does this mean? So for contention run, probabilistic support relations are intrinsically transitive. And we understand that, right? Because one relation, one connection between the relations, right? The connection between A and the connection B, between B, these are not conceived of in terms of deductive certainty like we're usually understanding in deductive logical context, right? For example, if A entails B, the only way for B to be true is if A is true. If A is true, then B is just going to necessarily follow. But it's not the case, right? Let's say, for example, uh, let's say that there is a likelihood of the event that I can flip on a light switch, right? And so if I go and I flip my light switch on, right, then the, in the event that I hit the switch and then the light turns on, 
then there is a connection between my action of flipping the switch and then the light turning on. Now, is this a, a, a necessary, was it in logically entailed that that state of affairs occurred? Is it, was it metaphysically necessary that when I flip the light switch that the light turns on, that there are, that it's impossible for an alternative state of affairs to occur? Well, absolutely not. It's 100% dependent and contingent. And that's what probabilities give us, is that it's always conditional. It's always dependent upon the context. And so the context, right, it, it could be different. There, there could have been some short circuiting in the wiring somewhere, and maybe the light bulb was dead, right? And I needed to replace it. It's been years since I replaced the light bulb, and I could totally hit the switch and the light not turn on. So there are scenarios where I could, you know, the outcome space of what can actually occur, I could actually hit the light switch and have no light turn on. So it's not an, an entailment. It is not a necessity that if I do that action, then that event follows. And so when we're dealing with events, right? and are informing beliefs about such events, they themselves cannot be intrinsically transitive because just like entailment and implication, it does not work the same way here. And so then what, then how does, how do these relations of support and these degree of support relations, how do they become transitive? Well, that's what contention two is all about here is about that. There are, there are conditions that if they are satisfied, they actually would render the support relations extrinsically transitive, right? So it wouldn't change the intrinsic nature of, of probabilistic support relations, but rather something interesting happens when we introduce maybe a, an, a, an additional proposition. And if we follow the flow, we have screen off conditions. If you're not used to screening off and understanding what screening off conditions or relations are, perfectly fine. This is the right video to be watching. We're going to go over that. And I have three papers that for us to, uh, for us to be familiar with here. We have the condition for transitivity in probabilistic support. This is pioneered by Tomoji Shogenji, posted this in 20, 2003, got this published. And if you read this paper, like I said, be in the description, you'll understand that Tomoji Shogenji's understanding of a probabilistic support relation being transitive is if and only if it satisfies this screen off condition. Then we have another paper written by Roche, a weaker condition for transitivity in public support. So now we are weakening the strength of the kinds of screen off conditions what we are using. And then we have, as of 2021, I believe this paper, we have a new condition for probabilistic transitivity of probabilistic support, and this is even weaker. So this is the weakest relation, and they actually, David Atkinson, and I am so sorry with my pronunciation of German, but Jean Pennenberg, I, I'm ashamed of myself. Anyway, so that's how that's working here. And so what you see is, is they all these, these, we have one, two, three different philosophers, sorry, four different philosophers who agree that transitivity can only be obtained if a certain screen off condition, if, if a screen off condition is, is satisfied. They're just pioneering the question. And the more interesting question is, well, what kinds of screen off conditions are going to be the most viable? And it's really interesting to entertain the literature. It is, it is for them. It is uninteresting to talk about screen off conditions, allowing for probabilistic support to be transitive. The question is, well, what kinds? And that's what exactly what we're going off of here. And this is some good coffee. So with that said, how do we conceive of, of the screen off condition? Well, first, I'm going to go ahead and, and tell you guys, and I probably have it somewhere outlined here in this whole essay. Yeah, what does it mean to screen off? Okay, let's start here and then we'll go through this. So screening off, it's simply a concept in probability theory and philosophers that refer to a situation where an intermediate proposition or an event, right, renders the original L evidence irrelevant to the final hypothesis or event when conditioning on the intermediate proposition. Whoa. Now, that is some informal language to describe a formal process that can be mathematically proved or actual mathematical theorems and proofs that these philosophers use. But like, what does this mean in plain English? Well, I love what Trent Doherty actually uses. Philosopher Trent Doherty actually uses an example in his book on animal problem of animal pain, where he can kind of conceive of a screen off condition and think about these things as defeaters, right? You, you have a scenario, we have an event, let's compare two events. And the first event is uh, the only information you have on this event 
is that there is a woman writhing and screaming in excruciating pain, right? That's the first event. Now, if you just sit with that, like allow that to sit in your body for a second. Uh, if you allow that to sink in, it's uncomfortable. Uh, there seems to be something wrong happening here. There seems to be something abhorrent happening here. We don't want to think about women, women uh, writhing or screaming in pain. That is, is it, that's excruciating. What is happening? But then you have a second uh, proposition or an event, which is, oh, this uh, woman is giving birth to her first child. Well, that's an amazing day. That's a happy day. She endorses this day. And she would gladly do it again because she loves her children. Well, that actually serves to screen off the negative impact of the first proposition uh, via an intermediary or, or a supplemental proposition about what is actually happening. And so when we get this further context, we can actually embed the first event or proposition within the wider and greater context of the second proposition. And when we understand the order of explanations rather than the order of learning, and we're going to get into that in this presentation, then we understand that, oh, okay, well, this greater context actually defeats the negative impact. It screens it off from affecting the fundamental realities taking place, which is that this woman, that this is a positive event happening, that this woman is having her first child. And that's ultimately what screening off does in a more of a real world context. So going through the different descriptions of the conditions, you have Shogenji's condition, Roche's weaker condition, and you have Atkinson's and Penenberg's very weak screening off condition. So how does Shogenji describe his condition. Well, his he gets transitivity and probabilistic support and it holds through an intermediate intermediary proposition y and it screens off the original evidence x and with respect to z, right? So y screens off the original evidence x in respect to z. And then Roche's weaker condition uh it lacks that and says, well, uh, transitivity can take place where y does not have to perfectly screen off the screen off x with respect to z but it just must must satisfy a less strict inequality in doing so and then we have the very weak screen off condition and it's this is an even weaker condition than roche's where it can still ensure transitivity or probabilistic support allowing for negative contributions to actually hitch a ride in transit as long as the overall support is positive so as long as so you don't even need to have to you can even have negative influence right still remaining you can even have some residual disconfirmation and as long as it satisfies my apologies for the mic as long as it satisfies this greater condition then it can ride along and actually be transitive and actually end up supporting the uh the hypothetical proposition so moving forward then we went through what screening off is it's it's interesting to read shogenji's abstract that he puts for his paper and he calls it a condition for transitivity and probabilistic support. And this is how it reads. And I really like this because he explains it in a much more succinct way than I've been explaining it in terms of how we are to conceive of the intrinsicality and extrinsicality of probabilistic support being transitive, non-transitive, et cetera, and so forth. He says, it is well known that probabilistic support is not transitive, but it can be shown, see, is not transitive. Cannot be, it can be shown that probabilistic support is transitive provided that the intermediary proposition screens off the original evidence with respect to the hypothesis in question. This has the consequence that probabilistic support is transitive when the original evidence is testimonial, memorial, or perceptual, which is all the three domains of evidence we could ever have i.e. to the effect that such and such was testified, remembered, or perceived. And the intermediary proposition it's, is its representational content, i.e. to the effect that such and such occurred, right? Oh, beautiful, amazing. So I put a little spectrum here to conceive of visually how we are to entertain these different conditions. So we have this these boundary conditions, the spectrum that starts that stems from one extreme on the left hand side going the left direction, very weak, and the right hand side going the right direction, very strong. And so Atkinson and Penenberg is going to they're gonna lie here. Or Ponenberg, whatever you want to say. Uh, they they lie here in the very weak side. Roche is going to be between a a moderately uh a moderate view moderately strengthened view, he's going to be between here. That's where I put him subjectively. And then Shogenji is just going to be in the, on the other right-hand side. His is going to be very strong because 
his 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 actually has a the screen off condition being satisfied in terms of the proposition just perfectly screening it off the representational content completely overlaps over the actual evidential proposition so with that being said we're going to to go further into how we understand these these different screen off conditions so continuing our procedure here moving on to the different screen off conditions we have obviously as stated here, we have Shogenji's equation, we have Roche's equation, and then we have Atkinson's and Ponenberg's conditions. And these three conditions are going to yield different levels of sensitivity. They're going to yield a different level of results. So first, let's start off with this one. And it's Shogenji's equations for transitivity and public support states that for transitivity to hold the proposition, so in this case, Y, must screen off the original evidence X with respect to hypothesis Z. So formally, that would be the probability of Z given X and Y is just going to be equal to the probability of Z and Y. And so in this case, right, is Y is making irrelevant X as far as its impact at all on the probability function in relation to Z, right? And then, of course, the negations on the other side here. So this means that the conditional probability of Z given both X and Y is just the same as the conditional probability of Z given Y alone. And then similarly for the negation. So this condition ensures that once Y is known, X provides no in additional information about Z. So X, in a sense, becomes probabilistically irrelevant once Y is known, is what that is saying. And if we move into Roche's equation here, and the flow actually goes up this way. I'm going to come back to that because I feel like it's better if I keep explaining. Roche's equation laxes it just a little bit more than as we discussed earlier. And what it says, it says the probability of Z given X and Y is just greater than or equal to the probability of Z given Y and similarly for the negation. And in its expanded form, it says this is a weaker condition compared to Shogenji's simply because it does not require that the intermediary proposition perfectly screen off x from z so y does not have to perfectly screen off x from z instead it only requires that knowing y makes x at least as informative as it was without y allowing for a, re a weaker relationship so the couch cash in on this language here it only requires that knowing x makes knowing y makes x at least as informative as it was without y so instead of making x completely irrelevant it's just going to make them equal or you know maybe less relevant than it was before and some key points to remember about Roche's condition is that it only requires conditional probabilities do not decrease when conditioning on x in the presence of y or not y so if it only requires that the conditionals uh, do not decrease in when we are conditioning, then that's a less barrier to entry when we are actually applying these to particular scenarios and particular uh, situations where we have the three variables in place. And so again, that's that whole idea of we've gone from perfectly screening off to a more of a partially screening off. You can kind of call it that. And so this weaker requirement allows for cases where Y does not fully screen off X from Z, but the transitivity and probabilistic support can still hold under this condition. So the probabilistic support can still continue to remain in transit, even if right it is a it is a partial uh, screening off happening here. And then the weakest condition so far is Atkinson and Ponenberg's condition, and this is just expressed as as so you have the summation of the two probabilities here, right? And what this reads is all this is saying is that the support P gives to R given Q plus the support that P gives to R given not Q plus the baseline support. So this is what the, uh, the, uh, oh, I forget what this, uh, Greek, I forgot what the Greek language, what the Greek, uh, I think this is the 19th uh, letter in the Greek alphabet. I forget what this is formally called, but this is standing right here for the baseline support, uh, plus the baseline support of the support. P gives the R given Q, and that has to be greater than or equal to the tolerance parameter, which is what this is for the support P gives the R given Q. Okay, so that's that's that in its very kind of technical jargony language there. And so it relaxes the requirement even further, right?
And so another way to put this is as long as this inequality meets a certain threshold, then the screening off condition is satisfied and you can actually have indirect support happen, i.e. transitive probabilistic support. That's what that would mean. So, so the combined support from the intermediary proposition on the evidence and our hypothesis, as long as that meets a certain minimum threshold, which is going to be defined by our tolerance parameter over here, then you can actually have indirect support or transitive probabilistic support go through. But like I said, I wanted to pop back up over here and show you guys exactly when it does not hold, because that's also important to understand the negative side of things. So even under Shogenji's more uh, rigorous screen off condition here, it says even if X probabilistic supports Y and Y probabilistically supports Z, it does not necessarily follow that X supports it. It does not necessarily follow that X actually supports Z in this instance. And so Shogenji provides examples that illustrate cases where transitivity does not hold, right? Simply knowing that someone ha that you have a doctoral degree and that someone is an academic philosopher and that they're and and so one notable example involves three variables, right? You have these propositions, doctoral degree, having a doctoral degree, I could be an academic philosopher and being well paid. Just because the academic philosopher could support doctoral degree or doctoral degrees could support the proposition of being an academic philosopher. Um, even if being an academic philosopher could end up supporting being well paid, it doesn't follow that being well paid ends up supporting the fact that you have a doctoral degree, right? Because this isn't happening through implication, right? Or entailment. And so th what we'd have to do is we'd have to have the intermediary here screen off the proposition here from the original hypothesis, right, or whatever that hypothetical proposition is for that to go through. So that's an example where just having three variables all support one another in isolation doesn't mean that they actually have a relationship with one another probabilistically. Okay, so moving forward. Now we understand a little bit more about how transitive probabilistic support works in all three weaker conditions or all three conditions from the strongest to the weakest. We can go through how Shogenji defines his and then in more greater detail and then we can move into Ponenberg's here. And we're going to skip Roche's because we're actually going to be using Ponenberg and Atkinson's uh, equation or at least their weaker condition for screening off to support our theistic uh, conclusion here because this whole idea is about applying this to natural theology. Okay, so suppose Y screens off X from Z so probability of Z given X and Y is just equal to the probability of Z and Y. Then you get two, and then you get this expanded form over here. And in more of a informal way of putting that is if we have our intermediary proposition B, B acts as an intermediary proposition or mediates the support between A and C. And once B is known, the impact of A and C is rendered irrelevant. And this is just due to the screening off condition, right? Oh, at least it meets the screening off condition because the screening off is actually happening. And then so... If we move on to A, then we actually have a, a result where we gain no further information or extra information from A. So A's relevance to C must be fully captured by B. That, that must be perfectly represented, right? If this holds, then the probabilistic support from A to B and from B to C ensures that A supports C through B, right? And so the support that A is giving to C is indirectly happening because it's being mediated. So in a sense, there's a middleman, right? There's someone standing in between A and C. And the only way that A has a relationship to C is because of A's relationship to B. And then B is going to mediate that relationship to C. And, and B is going to be able to screen that off. And so what's ends up happening is then you can just actually maintain or you can actually confer a transitivity of probabilistic support in this situation. And that's exactly what that says here. But then if we move to the weakest condition that we're entertaining here, again, to just go briefly back through how the equation works, is that you have to sum of the probabilities of the support P gives to R given that Q is true and the support that P gives to R given that true is false. And these terms capture the difference in support provided by the proposition P to R under the conditions Q and not R and not Q, right? And then you have your baseline support, and so it's just the general expectation or, or the level of support we would, uh, you know, more without any expect, exceptions we would expect for these propositions to have in relation to one another. And then obviously then we have our tolerance parameter. 
And this term scales the expected support measure that the baseline support gives us, allowing for a range of conditions. So the parameter can be adjusted to make this condition weaker or stronger. So yeah, so that's what the epsilon is doing in, in this situation. Okay, and continuing with the rest of the flow here. Now, now what happens once we understand exactly how uh, Atkinson and Ponenberg's equation goes? Well, this is a way that we can look at it and have it visualized for us, a, a representation here, is that you have your three propositions, you have your evidential proposition, you have your intermediary proposition, and then you have your hypothetical proposition. And if we're going to use Shogenji's example of being an academic philosopher, having a doctoral degree and being well paid, our evidential proposition is having a doctorate, right? And our intermediary proposition is being an academic philosopher. Well, within the framework of the of the very weak screen off condition here, then what that would be is if we entertain our three propositions, we could say that, you know, the support that having a doctorate gives to being an academic philosopher, that support ultimately is going to be determined by the support that the evidential proposition gives to being well paid, right? And this is going to be represented by this marked or dotted arrow here, and that's the indirect aspect of the support. Notice how this is more of a direct access of support here, right? And so the evidential proposition linked to the intermediary proposition is going to have an indirect relationship to the hypothetical proposition being well paid. And then so again, continuing with our equation here, the support that having a Dr. A gives to being well paid C, given that the person is an academic philosopher. And so what you're really doing is you could think about the intermediary proposition here acting as the background context by which all the events are playing out within, right? So everything has a background context, everything's embedded within a context. And if we contextualize, then we're saying that having a doctorate and being well paid, if it is, con if it is embedded within an environment where this person is an academic philosopher, then the value would likely be positive is what this says here, because having a doctor can actually be seen as supporting a higher likelihood of being well paid when it is known that the person is an academic philosopher. So that's the idea is that when we understand what the constraints are, or at least what the conditional is, right? Well, it's contextually dependent. That's what that actually means. So, well, it really all depends, right? If the positive value can only happen because having a doctorate and being an academic philosopher, um, then knowing those two things, then it could raise the likelihood that, you know, one is well paid. And then continuing to the, to the second portion here, right, you have the negation. And the negation is going to be when the intermediary proposition is not true, or at least when the context that we are working with, that we are embedding these events with inside, does not exist or is not true. And it says here that the support of having a doctor A gives to being well paid C, given that a person is not an academic philosopher, that's the negation of B, this, this value still might be positive, but just a weaker, right? The influence must be, might be a little bit weaker because even without being an academic philosopher, having a doctorate could still provide some support for being well paid, even though it is less direct, right? Than it could be. It could literally be more direct, but it's a little bit less direct. And then moving to the third part, we have the baseline support. And the baseline expected support is just having a doctorate gives to being well paid. Wouldn't just know that a person is an academic philosopher? Well, this is likely high because both having a doctorate and being an academic philosopher strongly suggests being well paid. And that's more so what's happening here. And so a lot of the times, right, if you're looking at this and you're wondering, well, doesn't that sound like a repeat? Well, this is just general, right? Like generally in these circumstances, you know, we don't have any, ex we're not entertaining any exceptions to the expected baseline support here. Then if this is also po uh, positive or this is high, then we can expect that to actually be high. And then that's going to actually communicate with our tolerance parameter much better. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing when we apply this to natural theology. So how is this going to look in natural theology when we apply this to the existence of God? Well, first, the first part we have to acknowledge is that this is not going to involve us looking at isolated individual data points. Rather, this is going to involve us using that embedded contextualization that I talked about earlier. What is the difference? Well, the embedded contextualization happens because it is the it is the environmental parameters that we are looking at that is going to give us the support that we would have between the first two propositions. So if you have your intermediate proposition be B, 
then B is going to be what designates how we're going to assign our probabilities to the support that A would give C. Given the very weak screen off condition, the equation or the theorem that they have set out for us. And so instead of asking the question, well, you know, this conditional on that, A conditional on B, you know, what's the probability, right? It's more so what's the probability of A of A conditional on C if, right, or what's the probability of A and C taken together when A is actually supporting C if we exist in a world where B is our general environmental conditions that give rise to these other events. That's more so what we're saying. And so if you come down here, then we have the theistic narrative, right? And this is ultimately what our background embedded context is going to be. So our intermediary proposition is going to be our theistic narrative. Now, what do I mean by a theistic narrative? Well, ultimately, right, the whole idea is that reality is directed, it's goal oriented, right? It's produced by an or by a mind. Right. And the idea is that in a theistic universe, right, things actually do have orienting connections to one another. And so there is a narrative for how things unfold. Right. Right. Current events signal towards later events. And that's what the narrative is doing. And so the narrative sets up the terms and conditions for everything that is going to unfold, uh, begin to exist or just remain in existence. And so if that is our intermediary proposition, then we have our perceptual data, which is our evidentiary pro evidential proposition, which is just going to be our observations. Now, take a look at this. These are two ways in which this can occur, right? See how it's mostly represented, how this particular aspect of the proposition, which is uh, being represented by the circle, see how the capture that the theistic narrative is giving to this circle here is it's mostly right. I mean, there's a little bit of space left over here, but most of the space is captured, right? So that'd be more like a partially screening off kind of happening there versus perfectly screening off where the theistic narrative, the intermediary proposition fully encapsulates, fully captures and fully represents their perceptual data, our evidential proposition. And then notice how the relationship is indirect then. So it's an indirect, you know, represented by this dotted arrow the evidential proposition is indirectly supporting theism, which is our hypothetical proposition. And the same thing happens over here, except the only difference is that you get this full representation, you get this perfect screening off scenario unfolding. And then so we have then I can put forth two candidate intermediary propositions that we can actually use. And the question I want us to ask is, if we are going to advance ourselves from more of a cumulative case style approach to theistic argumentation, right, or re at least reasoning to God, then what is the overall, what is the broadest uh, cosmic, you could say, you know, uh, parameters or ontic parameters that we can use to encapsulate any data that would be able to come about, right? And so if you're familiar with Richard Swinburne or any of uh, theistic philosophers that use a more inductive approach to natural theology, you will recognize that they rely on general facts. And we add up these general facts, you know, we have, we have a cumulative boost in probability and we can see what the probability is on total evidence. The difference here is that instead of adding up, you know, isolated different general facts, what we're actually doing is we actually have one main fact, which is going to be the embedded context, the environmental c conditions, the terms and conditions for how reality unfolds. And if we're going to ask ourselves, well, what's going to be the one that's going to, at least if we're going to attempt to uh, capture all of reality, what is that hypothetical proposition? Sorry, what is that intermediary proposition going to look like? So I have what I call the upside precondition. And then, of course, I am entertaining Trent Doherty's saint making theodicy or saint making uh, teleo his teleological understanding of saint making as our embedded context. So, what is the upside precondition? Well, the upside precondition refers to these three uh, aspects. And we, and we can characterize the upside three precondition in this way. First, all things work out for good. That's the idea is that anything that exists past, past, present, or future, all those things are going to work out for some good. It's going to serve itself towards some good. 
and the goods that it's going to serve itself towards are what I call protological good holes and eschatological good holes. Protological good holes, protology just refers to origin. So I'm going to, so I'm just mainly talking about things that have occurred in the past, right? So things that have already existed. And then we we'll refer to eschatological good holes as things that are going to exist or state of affairs that have yet to exist. And so the idea here is that the protological good holes are serving the existence of the eschatological good holes. And so there is this complex causal matrix, this complex interactive and that is causal reality that is going to be characterized by protological good holes and eschatological good holes. And all these things are working out for good. And so it's the idea that if you have temporary bads, right, well, all bads are going to be temporary because the bads are going to uh, turn themselves into goods. And then goods can either maintain their goodness or they can increase in goodness. And what I mean by whole is this more understanding of organic unity that, you know, the, 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 if we look at the if we're going to assign value to a particular entity or state of affairs, we can chop it up in terms of its parts and we can balance off the negative parts or the positive parts. But ultimately, the the, the whole can have a completely different set of properties than, than the parts have uh, over and above the whole. And what emerges on the whole is what we can call good on the whole. So you can have positive aspects of an entity and negative aspects of an entity, but then you can look at the entity on the whole and the entity on the whole can be good. And you can ask yourself that question, well, how, how would that look for an, uh, inanimate objects, inanimate objects, and then of course the human minds. And we can go into that. And then of course the content for saint making, if no one's familiar with that is just more of an, evol it's a modification or maybe an advancement of soul of the like soul making or soul building theodicy. And the idea is that we have environmental conditions that are saint fostering and Trent Doherty defines saint fostering as it is an environment that fosters the production of creatures who are, uh, exemplify the highest manifestations of agape love, which is virtues like self-sacrifice, uh, gratitude, charity, self-giving, altruism, things like that. And because of that, then, you know, to be a compassionate person, to be, give a, be, to be a giving person, right, all of those, be a self-sacrificing person, all of those things will also require significant trials and significant evils. Right. And so it's a logical entailment there, meaning that if this is our intermediary proposition and, you know, significant evils is our evidence, then we're actually going to have a perfect capture here. And then, of course, the whole idea is that it provides opportunities, right? But these opportunities aren't going to be so far outside of someone's reach that they can never actualize these opportunities. So the environment must be set up in a way to provide uh, ample chances for success and a significant amount of saintliness exemplified. And so we can both conceive of this in terms of an opportunistic manifold. Remember the interactum that I'm talking about, which is, is always a give and, give and take between uh, this window of opportunity. And actually, Viktor Frankl talks about this idea that there's this window of opportunity between stimulus and response. And the whole idea here is that be, between what is occurring to you and then how you respond to what is occurring to you, you have a choice exactly of how that response is going to play out. And that's going to be mediated exactly by the attitude that you form towards the particular conditions. And so in the same way, there is this there's an opportunity in every single state of affairs that actually ends up instantiating itself or obtaining in reality. There's an opportunity for, there's that window of opportunity, that threshold, that upper and lower threshold for that particular state of affairs to actually transform and actually serve the good or transform and actually serve the bad, right? And in situations with humans, it's gonna be in terms of what we do with our wills and in situations for a low, uh, lower creatures, you could say no, lower animals, you know, less higher order cognitive functioning or just inanimate objects like ordinary objects, uh, bare particulars and things like that. Then we're going to apply a different there's going to be a different dynamic happening there, still abiding by the same rules. And so do the, in, do the candidate intermediary propositions possess the requisite representational content is our question. Well, let's answer that question for Saint making. The content of the hypothesis suggests that significant evils are not going to be arbitrary or gratuitous, but deserve a divine purpose in the sense that it is to, and this is where the Irenaean aspect of the soul building theodicy comes through. The Irenaean aspect of the soul building uh, theodicy comes through in the sense that we were, we were purposefully allowed and permitted to be created immaturely so that we could grow and mature, right? And we could actually grow these virtues. And so the divine purpose here is to exemplify these virtues of the highest moral order, right? The highest value orders.
And so St. Making the note as SM here is that is the environment by which saintly virtues are going to unfold. And so this can count as a justifying reason. But there's also more justifying reasons that we can get into because it's not going to be, in this sense, it is logically necessary for the significant evils to come about, but it's also uh, morally just for God to do so under the, under the defeat provision. If you aren't familiar with the defeat provision, it's just that organic unity idea applied to creatures. It's that idea that if someone looks at their life history and on the whole either endorses or does not regret their life history, then even if it contains some bad parts, the bad parts actually necessarily end up contributing to the good parts, it being good on the whole. And so then the whole idea is that the person ends up basically defeating the negative impact in light of their life history. Uh, in a sense, there you are screening off axiologically uh, the parts of your life history that you do find negative. So the outcome is that the eventual value that arises from individuals becoming saints outweighs and defeats the immediate harm caused by the significant evils. And then furthermore, we read, the same making hypothesis proposes that God will allow significant evils because they are necessary for creating opportunities for humans to develop saintly virtues, such as courage, compassion, and forgiveness, and that cannot be cultivated without the presence of evils. So the representational content of the saint making hypothesis is that significant evils are instrumental Right, so not intrinsically instrumental to a larger morally good outcome, right? One that is good on the whole, and that is going to be uh, characterized and ex exemplified in terms of what we understand to be saintly creatures, right? And this is specifically going to be for human animals, but the whole idea is that we can extend this to to, to non-human animals as well through the uh, through the evolution of their constitution, such that they enjoy cognitive faculties such as humans do. And so we have the three variables here. We have saint making, significant evils, and we have good holes. And if we think about putting those together, we're comparing the representational content. We can either we can either have a saint fostering environment fully represent significant evils, or we can have a saint fostering environment fully represent uh, sorry partially represent significant evils, but mostly represented. Right. So we have fully represented and mostly represented, and it all funnels down to the same exact spot: the residual unrelated content. Right. This portion right here is allowed, and that actually goes through as being transitive, and the residual negative influence is allowed. And so one of the one of the consequences, actually beautiful consequences of the very weak screen off condition, the one that we're working with right now, is that it allows for residual confirmation as long as it's not too large to actually go through in transit, where uh, the confirmation is what goes through. Uh, but the disconfirmation doesn't travel through such that you actually get this this contradiction where you have confirmation and disconfirmation happening at the same time. So then what about the upside precondition, which is our other one, right? Well, that's just going to set our boundary conditions and constraints for the way in which our, the environmental pressures of reality unfold. At, the, at this side of the boundary conditions, we have intrinsic opportunity for protological and eschatological good holes. So at least, right, you have just the bare minimum opportunity. There is, there's every state of affairs has an intrinsic opportunity to grow and transform and evolve itself into a good hole. And then, of course, we have on the other extreme, uh, the realized opportunity. So every single opportunity is realized and all things become good holes. And that's more so the boundary conditions. And that means that reality, right, a theistic universe would then predict to land anywhere within these constraints. And that's how that works there. So then if we're going to apply that to support to both theses, then one, let's just recap the structure, right? So we have the support P gives the R given Q, the support P gives the R given not Q, the baseline expected support P gives the R given Q, and of course we have our tolerance parameter, which is the epsilon, and that's going to be an interval between zero and one. And this is what it looks like here. So Q is represented by this, by this uh, dotted line here, which is, hey, you know, it, we're, we're assuming, you know, assuming hypothetically that this is the case, then we know that P and, P and R have a relationship already, and P and R is going to be determined by whether or not this is realized. And so, going down, this is what it looks like. We have our initial evidence of our proposition, Q is our intermediate proposition, and R is our final hypothesis or our outcome. So we can look at the final hypothesis as our outcome. And so the support that P gives the R given Q, the support that P gives the R given not Q, our baseline expected support, and the epsilon, our tolerance parameter, is a positive scaling, a small but positive scaling factor. 
what they mean by small here is it doesn't require it, it's not too rigorous, right? It's not too, uh, extraordinarily sensitive, such that it's going not going to allow for the intermediary proposition, the, the intermediary proposition in this sense is actually doing a sufficient job of explaining uh, the data here and connecting to the to the hypothetical proposition. That's ultimately what that is saying. And so moving forward, then if we look at this in terms of saint making significant evils and theism, this is ultimately where you would want to land at if you're wanting wanting to understand exactly how theism could in principle, actually have evil as its evidence. Well, let's continue on. In the context of Atkinson and Ponenberg's condition, we interpret the support relationships as follows. So we have the support A gives to C given B, which is just going to be the significant evils, right, provides to the existence of God, given that we live in the same fostering world, right? So the idea is that if we are asking, hey, God can only be good if he is justified in permitting these evils. And if God has a justifying reason for permitting these evils, then there is going to be no problem, and then theism can actually screen off the negative impact from evils. And then if it satisfies that condition, then those evils can actually support theism. So the idea here is, well, how can God be good, right? So how can God coexist with significant suffering? And the idea is, well, if God is creating this saint-fostering world ensemble such that every, every creature has the opportunity to outweigh and defeat their sufferings, but their sufferings have the intrinsic potential to produce saintly exemplification, then that's, then that's really what we have to be asking our question about is like, do we live in that environment? And of course, you have our negation and the baseline expected support. And again, it's represented the same way here as we represented it over here. So moving forward then, we have A as our evidential proposition, B as our intermediary proposition, and C as our final hypothesis or our outcome. And again, it's just good to make sure that we are we are understanding and being able to keep up with the structure here. And so what we want is we want uh, A to have a small scaling factor. We want, and as long as that is the case when our, with our tolerance parameter here, then we can say that uh, transitive probabilistic support is actually happening, or we can have that indirect confirmation. I want to say a little bit first about the particular being and the nature of the being that we're positing right now. So Bern always talks about how, hey, you know, your predictions are going to depend on the nature of the being posited. In this situation, the nature of the being posited is what we call a maximal power trope. This is, I actually get this from Joshua C. Jawadi. I actually have his book right here. And the idea here is that God is a self-exemplifying property instance of maximal power. That's what that means. And an aspect of God being a maximal power trope is that God has the power to do all good things right, and perform all good actions. And so we call that maximal goodness. And an aspect of maximal goodness is that God performs the available best actions, best kinds of actions, available many good actions, and never any bad actions. And then modestly, we are just assuming the thesis of motivational internalism, which says that our moral judgments are going to just be intrinsically, or in a sense, necessarily connected to our motivations, right? And so there's not going to be a situation where there is a disconnect between our moral moral judgments and our moral motivations. If we judge something as good, we are motivated to do that thing that is good. And so that's how God is motivated. And so the only constraints we have is that the only way for a for God to be a maximally good, as stipulated earlier, is for the intermediary proposition to obtain if significant evil, evils obtain. So really, like I said, this is a very conditionalized statement here, which is, well, God there is never going to be a situation where significant evils exist and there's not this more broader saint-seeking story, right? Where there's an afterlife or redemption and victoriousness, right? At least for the potential for that to exist. And so now getting into the argument, this is what it, what it looks like for us. Okay, starting from the top here, we have God. And what we have is an arrow drawing showing us that there's a probability of one that God is going to perform these kinds of actions and never any bad actions, because that's just exactly what it means for God to exist, is that God is basically good and aspect of maximal goodness, as said earlier, is the performance of these actions and the non-performance of bad actions. So then we start with a significant evils E, which is just a prevalence of significant evils or suffering, and we live in a, in a St. Fostering world, we call that S. This is that sing seeking story or narrative, Right? And this is just supposed to be a world ensemble where for uh, ample opportunities of, su of success and significant uh, chances of the productions of saints. And of course, we have theism, which is a hypothesis that God exists, right? 
and, uh, you know, is maintained by him in the triple omni sense. Okay, moving forward to the very weak screen off condition, how is that going to help us argue for the existence of God in this sense? Well, if we're going to indirectly have evil support theism, then we have to be clear of our variables. We have P, Q, and R, which is P is going to be safe and evils. Q is going to be identical to S, which is going to be a same fostering environment. And R is going to be identical to T, which is theism. And that's going to be our hypothetical proposition. And so if we're going to translate exactly what these variables mean, it's the whole idea that the support of the presence of significant evils provides to theism, given that the world is St. Fostering. Same thing, given that the world is not St. Fostering, and the baseline is like support that evils provide to theism, given that the world is St. Fostering. And so that's the whole combined support. If that combined support meets or is above our minimum threshold, then we can say that evils can actually indirectly support theism through this very weak screen off condition. Okay, so our inter intermediate proposition, which is our St. Fostering world, and simplified as S, the world with its significant evils is structured in a way where that fostered development of saintly virtues. So this proposition su suggests that evils serve a purpose by providing creatures the opportunity to grow morally, spiritually, and in virtue. But not only that, though, is that it meets the justifying stricture of defeat and outweighing the particular suffering that happens to them. And so here's the flow of our indirect support. Our significant evils, E, ends up supporting our St. Fostering world, and our St. Fostering world ends up supporting theism. Now remember that this St. Fostering world is supposed to be able to screen off significant evils. So significant evils, if it does have a direct impact on, on theism, it's going to challenge negatively the probability of theism. And so it doesn't, it's, there's no direct support here. However, evils could indirectly support theism given how positive the relationship is between E and S. And that's going to be, that's going to look like this here. If we have Savior Evils E fully captured by our Saint Fostering environment, then we know that the presence of Savior Evils are logically required for the development of saintly virtues. Okay, so then what's the value of this probability function is going to be positive. The sum of these are, is going to be positive, right? Okay. And this is going to be extremely low or it's going to be completely negative, right? Very close to zero, right? Because ultimately what we've already understood is that the only way for God to be good in the presence of these significant evils is that S is true. And of course we have our baseline expected support and it's going to be very high because there is no, uh, there is no significant evils occurring in conjunction in a theistic world unless the environment is St. Foster. And because we know that, then the whole idea then is that, well, if we embed significant evils in the in environmental parameters, the narrative that there is a saint-seeking story, that these evils serve a purpose in bringing about saintly exemplification and the defeat of evils, then this is ultimately something that theism predicts as a probability of one that would happen. And ultimately, right, it is a it, it meets or is above the minimum threshold articulated by and defined by our tolerance parameter, right? Because it does a the intermediate proposition, the Saint Fostering world, that Saint seeking story significantly or sorry sufficiently explains the existence of the evils. So I want to say a little bit about standard Bayesianism or Orthodox Bayesianism versus non-standard uh, Bayesianism which is there's really two differences in how we do go about our conditioning. And you can read more on this. I'm going to include that in the description. And the whole idea here is that for standard Bayesians, their conditioning is going to follow something we call diachronic consistency constraints, which is this idea that our learning, our, our theoretical learning, right, is ultimately going to be uh, following the suppositions of what we've learned in the past about said propositions. Whereas on a non-standard view, uh, there are very lax constraints when it comes to uh, diachronic consistency. And non-standard conditionalization actually allows for the bypassing of these diachronic consistency constraints, where instead of the following our past suppositions that we've learned about uh, our variables that we're working with, um, the priority being one of learning, it's actually going to be one of theories. It's actually going to be one of explanation. So it's going to be explanatory priority rather than uh, learning priority. And so the learning priority is going to be temporal priority, meaning that what matters is how we 
is our priors are going to be informed by what we've learned prior to actually assigning such priors because ultimately it's going to follow those past suppositions so it's going what's going to take priority is ultimately going to be the temporal sequence of things whereas explanatory priority is going to be something that trent doherty the philosopher nevin Klemenhaga, and others are going to actually endorse because they are non-standard bayesians so what does that mean well this is what Klemenhaga says about this he says philosophers have not clearly seen the objectivist implications of the way we employ bayes theorem partly because we use the term prior probability to refer to both to one of the terms of Bayes' theorem, an explanatory prior probability and the probability of a proposition for some agent prior to receiving some evidence, a temporally prior probability. The argument of this section, this is the section in his paper uh, on the degree of support interpretation, if anybody wants to read that, suggests that what matters for the proper application of Bayes' theorem is an order of explanation and not an order of learning. Conflation of the explanatorily prior probabilities with temporally prior probabilities has led to the conflation of the order of explanation with the order of learning. And this has made the degree of belief understanding, so subjective degrees of belief is gonna be something like Paul Draper follows, Jordan Howard Sobel, and other standard Bayesians. Uh, it has made the degree of belief understanding of probability appear more credible than it actually is. When we explicitly distinguish these, we see that in Bayesian reasoning, we are thinking about relations between propositions and not our credences before or after learning some evidence. And we might be asking, okay, well, why is this important? Well, this is important because when we talk about antecedent probabilities, often a theologians are going to object to this way of doing things where they're going to say, well, you know, the antecedent probability of significant evils uh, existing or animal suffering, for example, existing given theism is going to be low. But the whole idea is that if we deny temporal priority and when we opt in for explanatory priority then we we recognize that our abduction precedes our induction our explanation it guides our confirmation so we have two variables here a and a prime or sorry a and a star and a star given b is just influenced by explanatorily direct potential uh, explanations of a of a star, which means that all of our probabilities, even prior probabilities, are going to be, they're going to have explanatorily, explanatory antecedents, so it's all going to be conditional. Whereas this, right, the probability of A given B is going to be influenced by our earlier suppositions about what we learned about A. Ultimately, this is linked to Paul Draper's arguments from evil, which is he's going to say antecedent probability. Well, it's antecedently more likely uh, that this occurs in naturalism than theism, right? However, we have to entertain having paradigm shifts and corrections about our priors if we learn right that there might be some explanatory theory in conjunction with theism that actually helps it predict this data then we should opt in for that but of course he, as a non as a standard bayesian he has to be in line with the diachronic consistency constraints and he has to l do things in terms of order of learning and not order of explanation whereas a non-standard bayesian myself we can just opt in for whatever explanation is going to give us what we need and so saintly virtues, right, is going to be either temporally posterior to how we discovered the existence of evil. So we discover the existence of evils, then we learn about saintly virtues. Or what we can do is we learn about saintly virtues, but then we have that be our, explan our explanation, our higher order explanation, which is going to be explanatorily prior. And so what matters, like I said earlier, is the order of explanation and not the order of learning. And so that's going to defeat that objection given the fact that if you are a non-standard Bayesian, then this is going to be uh, putty in your hands. There's also uh, scathing critiques and complaints about the undesirable consequences that happen, and unresolvable consequences that occur when you are opting in for diachronic consistency constraints if you're conditioning in that way. Anyways, that is my speedrun version of transitive natural theology. There'll be much more videos explaining this further and breaking this down a lot more. Thank you guys for watching and tuning in, and we'll see you on the next one.